Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Well, welcome everybody to yet another episode of The Curious Advantage. I'm Garrick Jones and I'm with my co-author Paul Ashcroft. Hello. And we are delighted to be here today talking with Susie Collier. Susie is a professor at the Royal Academy of Music, but also Susie is a mother of Jacob Collier, the musician, and daughter Sophie and Ella. And we really are here to have a conversation about nurturing curiosity. Hello, Susie. Hello there. Nice to be here with you. Thank you. Susie, um, let's kick us uh, straight off um, to talk about what, what do you think curiosity is and how has it played a role in your life and what you do? I love the word curiosity. I think it's one that a lot of people are frightened of really because curiosity means that you're not staying in the same place, means that you're moving and willing to move around within your mind and within the world. It's about delving deeper, it's not seeing something just at face value, it's a will to understand something rather than to just know it. I suppose the other thing that I feel very strongly about is that if you allow curiosity to be at the head of what you're doing, then you're not going to be fearful because curiosity and fear just simply don't go together. It doesn't work if you're frightened to look and see what the deeper meaning is or to look at another way of actually seeing something, then you can't be curious. Mm. Susie, you mentioned being uncomfortable. Uh, as part of being curious, but also you talked about not being fearful. How do you strike the right balance? I think if you have got the balance right, you will know that entering into a situation, whether it's just going for a walk or it's in a lesson situation or you're with a group of people, you will know instinctively whether you are open to taking the chance that curiosity gives you. Basically, I think we have an automatic shut off when we don't feel like being curious and when fear takes over. And I think that is absolutely human, not to be judged, but curiosity is definitely to be encouraged. And I think we can do an awful lot to encourage just by the way that we are with other people. Yeah. So you you teach students, uh, you raise children, you um, are involved with young people and the practices of music and so on. Um, how did you come to this philosophy or how did you come to this place where you where you have a very considered opinion about what gets the best out of or what are the best conditions for enabling curiosity? It's living life for a long time. I think I always had that buzz, that that kind of wanting to reach out in that kind of a way ever since I was very young. I remember my dear dad saying to me, you've just come back on the underground train from having been to junior college, Royal College of Music, where my mother taught. And I would have spent a day there and I'd come home and I'd regale them with who I'd met on the train and what we talked about. He just said, I just wonder where you get it from, because it's definitely not from me. Um, I didn't analyse it too much, but I think the the next time I really thought about it in a cognitive way, Mm was when I had Jacob, who was my first child, and just really trying to realise what need is in a child, and what is want, and what is listening, and what does that mean? What does it mean for me to have my agenda of how I want things to be? And what does it mean for somebody to actually scribble all over that and say, that's just not going to happen? And that's what happens, I think, when you're, you're lucky enough to have a small person in your life who is really pressing those buttons. It's not the most frightening thing in the world to just say, okay, you know something, my agenda of exactly how I was going to spend this hour or what I wanted to teach you or give you um, at any given time has to just go out of the window. Around that time when I had that first child, you know, you listen to a lot of friends and I think I heard a lot of them say, Mm. it's all about routine, not listening to them scream. Um, Otherwise you're going to indulge that person. And I love and respect so much of what was said to me by other people but I realised that I had to do my own thing at source. I don't believe that it is yeah. indulgent to listen to somebody. I think it's indulgent for them to say, I want this and then I want that and I want the other. And for you to just say, okay, here it all is. And um, there's yeah. there's no thinking about it. I think that's a different thing. You can really listen, but you can have very, very clear boundaries 
and you can definitely say how you feel and put that in there. It's not just about listening one-sided. Yes. And that's the whole thing about curiosity, isn't it? The reason we reached out to you, Susie, was because I'd seen a uh, interview with Jacob, I think, at MIT, where he was talking about um, a story about when he was a young child and there was a vacuum cleaner and somebody would ask him mm. what he felt the the note was that the vacuum cleaner i mean you can is this correct is it true <laughs> it was my memory correct but the thing i remember about that story about the vacuum cleaner and perfect pitch development um was was something jacob said about um the question how the question was asked it wasn't a what is this note but i think what he said was what do you feel no. this tone is and that struck me and i was like oh my yes. god there's something about language and how you engage with people and their curiosity which has an impact on fostering that curiosity i wonder if you and 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 then I thought I really want to speak to Susie because she must know something. I had two violinist parents. My dad, in particular, just felt that the nature of pitch is just in us all, but it just needs to be nurtured. It just it's there. So he would very much encourage me to think in terms of colours of sound and how a note felt. I had that with um, all three of mine. It was exactly that. It wasn't just a vacuum cleaner. It could be a car horn. It could be absolutely anything at all. Speech is an interesting one as well. And how does it make you feel? What kind of note are you feeling is the most, the most, most pronounced in somebody's speech when they're speaking to you? How does it make you feel? Why do you think you feel unnerved by that sound? Is it something to do with the nature of the note itself? So maybe it's be natural but it's really on the sharp side and that's jarring your internal sense of western pitch or maybe it's to do with the timbre and how the sound is made without wishing to ask too many questions of a small person you can actually enable them to be asking questions they then begin to say yes yeah, so i'm feeling that's really that's really d flat and that's really warm and purple and and i feel i feel like it's a cuddle i was definitely brought up with that i think i just stretched it a little further um, in terms of how much my children could interact with that and take me along a journey so that they'd be teaching me something new. It's, uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk about that, Susie. And in particular, that's quite different, I think, from how, unfortunately, many people are taught in very much a process-based way or a mechanical way of learning by rote, um, whereas you're talking about being much more exploratory uh, or open and connecting different ideas that one wouldn't necessarily think to connect. That's right. That's a really important one to be unafraid of all sorts of different ideas coming in and somehow they all go together in an absolutely marvellous recipe. And it's because you've got some of these weird and wonderful things on board that you have this recipe. And you're also role modelling. It, it sounds like that you're role modelling through your questions and the way you're interacting, being open, be, being curious and encouraging that, um, I guess, in, in your students and in, in your children when you're wanting them to be more curious and explore themselves. How do we encourage our kids to be unafraid? I mean, Paul, you've got kids, I've got kids. Susie, I mean, what, what, what's the key thing, if there is one, I'm sure there are a few, but what's the thing that enables our kids to be unafraid? I think it's to do with a lack of judgment, um, it takes me back to, to various times that I have played music to other people, <laughs> maybe an A-level class or a GCSE class. Mm. And I play a piece of music and I'll say, you don't have to tell me that you like it and you don't have to say that you don't like it because all your friends don't like it. You can actually say exactly what you feel about it because every single opinion is subjective and you're allowed to say exactly what you like because there will be no judgment and i make it very very clear that before anybody speaks that we're not allowed to laugh or poke fun at the fact that somebody else has said that they really like a particular piece of music or a particular bit in it so i think that's a very strong image that comes to me because when you've got a class of people or an orchestra in front of you judgment's a funny thing you can pick it up from body language and just a look and a nod of the head and you just got to get rid of that completely so that people can just say this feels like i'm up in a balloon or i feel frightened and i don't really know why and if they can say that and it's left in the air then it can be explored and it can be understood 
I mean, I'm loving what you're saying because it's about creating a safe space or a place where people, not even an artificial place, but just a condition or an environment in which we feel open to be ourselves and express what we're feeling, even if we don't understand um, what those things may be. When you have a, a wonderful and not judgmental and open approach, how do you deal with kids who may not be engaged with that? Well, there are various situations in which this can happen. Um, it can happen in a very small group. It can happen just with, with one student. But I think where it's at its most kind of active, and I really need to think about it very carefully, is in the classroom for the people. Mm. And you're seeing them halfway through the day and you have no idea what they've experienced, but you are expecting so much from them. Within a classroom setup, I don't really like the idea of automatically sending out a child or giving them a detention because in one sense, that's exactly what they're expecting if they have done something so-called wrong yeah. in a situation. But I really do have to consider where they've been in their day. I have not a clue what's happened to them at all. If I possibly can, I try and create a safe place within that classroom. Um, if necessary, I might have to um, take them outside for a second, not in order to judge them and tell them off, but in order to just say that I acknowledge that there is something wrong and that I wonder whether they can just take a moment to just reflect on the day and to see what's happened to make this occur. Mm. I don't shout to groups of people either. It just inflames everything. So I want to try and take away judgment, yeah. but also without willing to get rid of boundaries, I also want to very much express that we are all equal as human beings. I'm no better than them because I'm older and bigger. And I do always say that I can't ask you to respect me, but I really would like to keep the communication channels open so that if you have a difficulty with what I'm saying, that you have the courage to say something and we won't judge you and I won't judge you at all. Because sometimes the people around you are much better judges of what's happening to the energy in the room. Yes. Whether something needs to change. So as much as I can... I do acknowledge it. I'll say, I think the energy's gone in the room and I think I'm going to give you an option of a couple of things we can do. Or we might go into something completely different. And this can be in an orchestra, it can be in a classroom, it can be in a one-to-one -one lesson, it can be absolutely anywhere. It can be in a conversation. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. That energy in the room, um, in every situation, how do we nurture curiosity um, to kind of follow a path in the room? Is there, is there other things we need to pay attention to in terms of um, being sensitive to the energy of, of, and curiosity? Um, absolutely. I think that you got to realize that, that even if you go in and the atmosphere feels quite dead and you're a bit worried because nothing really seems to be happening. Um, yeah. It all feels very dry. Yeah. You really have to have a belief. It's not a, it's not a self belief. It's a belief in energy itself, really. Mm. It's all there. And if it's all feeling dry, it's your job really, if you're being an enabler to literally let out the energy and allow people to bring a voice and to want to bring a voice into the situation. I think it's about realising that if you're trying to get a concept across to anybody, there is not just one way of describing it. But the idea is that if you just stay in one dimension when you're speaking about something, I think you can expect one-dimensional answers. Yeah. And in fact, recently I was in a teaching room and I saw that somebody had put up a piece of paper saying practice makes perfect and up your amount of minutes of practice every day and then you can tick the box. And I, I didn't know who put up the piece of paper, but I took it down and put it into recycling. My dad told me that some of the most important ways of really understanding how to finger through a piece or memorize a piece or understand the innate phrasing of a piece is to get away from the violin and to go for a walk or to eat a meal or just a bee. It Absolutely. takes you away from all the preconceptions you might have about what it is like to practice a difficult passage. And I guess that's the same with teaching anything at all. Yes. So the idea is that, yes, you can recognize it in certain ways, but you need to have a backup of a, a zillion different ways yes. of being able to recognize like multi-dimensionality so. that's the thing and i think that's the thing about absolutely anything we talk about i saw a wonderful um interview with billy eilish's mother and billy 
and um, her brother, Phineas, have been composing all of these songs that are uh, on the pop charts at the moment in their room. Billy Eilish kind of kicked it off and said, well, my mum encouraged us to play music all the time. And her mum's rule at home was that the two of them didn't have to go to bed as long as they were making music. And any and, and the definition of making music was fiddling around and doing anything. There wasn't any judgment or boundaries around what the definition of making music was. And so Phineas and Billie Eilish did that all the time, if they did. And that, to me, was a, a wonderful kind of indication of how you can create the conditions for, for people to feel totally free. You really can. Going back right to the beginning again, when I suppose Jacob was smallest and then when Sophie and Ella came along, it was very much about how to create sound or how to create some kind of magic within sound. We didn't need to have a whole lot of equipment to do that. And I think these days when we are so, we're so obsessed with what phone we have or what microphone we have or yeah. um, you know what violin we play on, Again, my dad used to say that when they went to um, sessions in London, recording sessions, would take in a really horrible violin worth about two and a half P. Yeah. And um, they'd hand it round. And the idea was that you had to continue in this session just making the most beautiful sound you possibly could out of the violin. Oh, that's nice. And it's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful um, idea because yeah. um, he used to say to me, you'll be surrounded by so many parents and students who just say, well, obviously my son stroke daughter would really like to play on a Stradivarius and maybe we ought to be selling our home and never go on holiday again in order to get this because they're really worth it. But actually, what you need to do is to perhaps sit with that violin that really is just a factory made box and learn how to coax a sound out of that. Because if you can do that, you can play anything forever. It seems to get to the heart of it, Susie, that because one one of the ideas we're fascinated by is the the inventor's lab. And people uh, from history have always been sort of curious and made made things by surrounding themselves with, as you're saying, ideas, senses, connections that they wouldn't necessarily have but also physical things that are just available to them to help them make stuff i think think there's nothing more inspiring than somebody saying here is a few here are a few things make something out of it in fact i'm sure there's a there's a program that i have listened to a kitchen program where they say here you go here are five ingredients what can you make out of this and i loved that program because it's exactly how i i like to be um i remember when my daughter took me to the ucl institute of making Mm. And it's this, I don't know if you've been there. Mm. It's this beautiful space in the middle of London where you've got every material just there. Yeah. Jars of this, jars of that, rolls of this, machines that can do this and that and the other. And I felt so excited because in a sense, you don't have to have any agenda at all, which brings me to the other thought that um, I have right now, um, which is that I do love to go into a situation uh, whether it's coaching the senior strings chamber orchestra at, at the Royal Academy of Music or into a classroom full of smaller people, um, thinking it's all right because I have some knowledge and I may have a bit of expertise, but I do not have a plan here and I really don't know how things are going to go. And um, it's interesting because in a rehearsal I took just last Saturday at the Academy, I said, look, how about we try this bowing this way in order to really do something different with the portato, Mm -hmm. uh, a particular kind of bowing, which is um, quite a breathed bowing. And I could see folks immediately grabbing their pencils to write it in. I said, no, no, please don't write it in because we got to see how we feel about it. Okay. We have no idea yet. Let's just, let's just see. Um, Let's go first. Yeah. (laughs) We love this idea. Uh, Paul and I talk a lot about iteration or the idea of of, of overcoming, you know, it, the only way to know something, we think, is to try and do it. And um, when you're curious, it does mean you have to go into um, new situations or meet new people. Yeah. And you have to, as you said, so you have to overcome the fear that we all have when we're entering new situations and don't know what we're dealing with. But you know, once you overcome that and you start to learn the language of doing things, the, the best way to, we believe, and um, is, to, is it works for music and it works for everything in life, is to give it a go. Try and build it. Try and make it. Try and try and um, put yourself in a position where you you're doing something 
and you very soon start to learn <laughs> where where it works and where it doesn't work. I would agree with that, but I think there's another thought in here, and maybe this again is the mother in me. I don't want to go into any situation and just think I want to have a go because I may be watching a fire eater or somebody <laughs> scale buildings and then jump over them. But I have to decide where it's unsafe for myself. And when you've got small children, unfortunately, you do need to put your foot down and, and, and maybe say something which they will disagree with. But how then do you encourage a lack of fear and, uh, and encourage curiosity at the same time as teaching people about respect and boundaries and safety, for example? I think it would be quite easy for you or I to differentiate between the place where I'm too fearful to even give this a go because I don't want to and I'm not feeling in the mood to go out of my comfort zone. So the fact is you have to weigh it up, don't you? But that's about making probably making some errors because you don't know. But you have to, in order to make the decision, you actually have to not have fear. And it's really crazy not to take that chance because it's all you have. Mm. But if you're fearful, it's going to colour everything about that decision. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. Can we talk about motivation uh, a little? Children, but even adults, perhaps think, oh, I'm curious about, I'm curious about uh, travelling, cooking, climbing rocks, uh, whatever it is. And they may get so far in their in their curious journey, but then sort of give up for some reason. Um, many reasons. Maybe they're fearful. Maybe they've had a bad experience. But sometimes it's just motivation that without some external force, like a parent, um, really encouraging them to continue to just do it and carry on, um, it doesn't come from within. I mean, hmm. Do you have any stories or experience of how to encourage that intrinsic motivation to keep people being curious? It's not about, it's going back to the idea of it's not about how much practice you do, but it's what you do in that room to keep the motivation going. I, and obviously I have come across, a, I normally teach older, older students rather than younger, but some of them still do have a parental input. But I tend to talk to parent and child about the process of becoming um, independent learning, actually for both of them. Yeah. So as a parent, you have to learn how to allow the process to happen in your child without you steering it. And that's a really, really tough thing. Yes. But it's a really wonderful gift to be able to give to somebody because if they can motivate themselves within their practice to take the next step, then that's really great. So again, it's about lack of judgment. It's about thinking about what you want to do. I really do advocate that to keep motivation, you have to do exactly the opposite of what you think you're being, you're telling yourself to do. I could tell you a small story that happened last night. So um, both of my, my children are, I mean, they're, they're fortunate as well. Their mother is a, is a pianist, also from the Royal Academy of Music. But they're in the midst of practicing for their exams at the moment, right? Which is, is great, but also to some extent is the opposite of what we've been talking about today in terms of loving loving and learning music but what was so nice is i i i came in uh, last night and the house was just awash with sound and music because they were all gathered around the piano writing songs my oh. daughter was writing lyrics oh. the boy was helping to produce uh, and and my wife their mother was just just you know helping along and putting some of the the frame and structure around it and they had such an amazing time and even she came out and said that was just fantastic, just to step away from doing all the things that we know we must do just to have fun with it. This is the, this is a, a really wonderful story. It's exactly the same thing. Of, you know, take the energy. Why don't we play some duets? Why, we, why don't we do some improvisation? And actually, why don't we explore a completely new piece that you have always wanted to have a look at? Let's find a place where you come alive. They're inspired. Right? Yeah. And suddenly you will get... The energy. Curious reset. It's like... That's right. It's about using curiosity to kind of go back to the root of why do we make music? We make music to connect with other people. We make music to connect with passion within us. We make music because it makes our hearts sore. I quite agree. But I think it's very, very difficult with um, the older child who is desperate to get a grade eight distinction because well as far as UCAS is concerned it does count for something sure uh, maybe UCAS would scream at me and say well we don't really think it's that important but we have to count your 
the well, things that you do. I mean, Susie, I come back with the, the idea of that for me, there's a relationship between freedom and openness and expression and also frameworks. Because framework, that's right, yes. Because I, you know, I, I love to improvise on the piano, but the only reason I can do it is because I had all those years of classical training, which gave me um, the basis, and then I had to unlearn it a little bit to be free. But um, having the scales in place and uh, and, and they, you know has gives me a, a a musical environment in which I can play. I am such a believer that of the of the premise that. If you want to really make the most intuitive and beautiful and natural phrasing in what you play, then you really have to have the technical chops to do it. My dear dad wrote a scale book and the way that he's written it and the fingerings and how it all works is really alternative. There's no other scale tome like it. <laughs> and um, and I love it. But within that... Um, he also encouraged scales to be practiced in a hundred different ways. Start from the top, start from the bottom, do it in this rhythm, do it in that rhythm. It's, it's to do with perception. So it can actually enable that person to really own the fact that scales are great because of the way it feels physically. I love the idea of owning the process. Um, we've talked about overcoming fear. We've talked about being open We've talked about understanding rather than knowing. Yes. And we've, we've talked about um, understanding the boundaries and safety um, and, and how you move forward in the relationship with energy in the room and curiosity and energy. And we've really talked also about the curious reset, this idea that if you are locked or bored or, or can't figure it out or don't know, try and come at it from multiple perspectives um, multiple multi-dimensionality. If you want to think energetically, multiple dimensions, and and try and find a way in by keeping on playing with it and, until you get to that to that point in some way. I'd also say that I'd probably get rid of the word try and I'd use allow. Oh, I love it. Try seems a little bit too earnest, doesn't it? It yes. seems as though I have to do something in particular for something to result and that just isn't the case it just is there already can we talk a little bit more about that allow well i think that in the world that we live in and with all the rules and regulations a lot of things aren't really allowed at all although we pride ourselves on being a, a free speech kind of country and a free thinking kind of country i think in the main we don't live by that at all and i think we're trying to be something uh, we're trying to do something or we're just incredibly goal orientated and even if i said I'd love to be the best violinist in the whole wide world. I can try as much as I like, but I will never actually get there. But if I allow myself to be the best violinist that I can be, then that's a completely different thing. And it's something that I've really learnt, I think, when I was a senior student at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, it's such a competitive environment. It's a wonderful environment, and it's a it's a thriving bed of amazing energy incredible talent and um exciting ideas but i remember being my second year and just thinking in order to actually go in and take part in these competitions and concerts i have to turn it around so it stops being about the goal that i have and it stops being about the ego i have or how i want to come across to other people it's much more about the gift that is innate and the work that has been done, just literally allowing it to come out. Again, not overthinking it. I think it's about allowing yourself a bit of give, really. So you just think, well, there's no reason for me to be frightened in this situation because it'll be as it will be. And I have, I have really thought about those patterns and how I can make a phrase work. I now need to allow it to come out. If I try, I may try too hard. And then we're really engaging with nerves and um, adrenaline going slightly the wrong way. I think we have such a job as performers to really give out in a way that puts your audience at ease. Mm -hmm. And it's not something you try and do. It's something that you allow yourself to do. And in essence, you actually have to practice allowing yourself to do that, which means that affects the way that you work at approaching a performance. The idea of asking people, what do you feel about this? And also allowing yourself to be 
whatever is innate so that your curiosity is not overwhelmed with fear. That's right. Or limited. And the relationship with the audience is fascinating. Well, it's a wonderful conversation, Susie. We could talk to you for hours and hours. <laughs> I was wondering, Susie, do you, as we as we sort of wrap this up a little bit, do you um, have any final thoughts? I mean, I'm taking away so much from this conversation, especially about the language use and allowing myself to be things. Are there any specific things that you would say to adults who are interested in curiosity and nurturing their own curiosity and allowing themselves to achieve things? You really have to remain open to being willing to be proved wrong because it's not about being right or wrong in any situation. It's not about even having the answers at all. Mm. It's not about feeling that you need to give something in particular to your child or tell them to practice an awful lot. I never did that with any of my children. I never told them to practice. I never said that um, an experiment was wrong. I tried to affirm and I'd still try to affirm what comes out doesn't mean I don't have a point of view, but I think it's about a a bed of seeds just really just waiting to to, to grow and to germinate and they just need enabling surroundings and good things around them just so that they can they can fledge and grow and decide which way they want to grow and I think that's I don't know if that's the essence of it all but it's certainly important my god thank you Susie so much it's wonderful chatting to you and um we look forward to ongoing conversation. Yes. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you both and to just reflect on the idea of curiosity and how to hold it gently in your arms rather than grasp. Thank you, Susie. That was wonderful. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. Subscribe to the podcast today. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.